Good evening. If you would please turn to Psalm 23. We read the 23rd Psalm, beginning with verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray together. Lord, we rejoice to be here this evening. We thank you for the opportunity we have in the middle of our week to gather for corporate worship. We thank you, Lord, that in the middle of our week we can encourage each other and we can join together out of that which we have already experienced from your hand on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Together, Lord, just lift our voices to you and give you thanks for how faithful and how good you are. And I thank you that tonight, Lord, I have the privilege to celebrate your goodness and your faithfulness by declaring the truth of who you are from this psalm. I ask, Lord, that you would empower this time and help me to handle your word in a way that what I declare is indeed what you have revealed. Help me, Lord, to handle your word in a way that what I say is true to the text and it's accurate. But Lord, accuracy in and of itself is not enough. What we need is for you to take it then in your hand and drive it home to our hearts so that our lives are affected tonight. We ask, Lord, that you would edify your church. We ask that you would encourage your church. We ask that you would cleanse your church through the powerful ministry of your word. And Lord, if there's anyone in our midst tonight who doesn't have a saving relationship to you, our desire and our prayer is that you would open their heart, that you would shine the light of the knowledge of Christ in, that you would call them forth from the spiritual dead and make them a member of your family by faith in your Son. Lord, you alone can save, and so we ask you to save. And we will thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think it's obvious, but at, at its heart, the 23rd Psalm is a psalm of confidence in God. It is a psalm of confidence in God. It is a confession of and a celebration of God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness, God's love, God's power toward his servant David and toward all of his children. David begins with a statement of personal relationship. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. And when we examined that statement, we noted four things about it. It is an astounding statement that God would be someone's shepherd, anyone's shepherd, but indeed he shepherds all of his people. It is an astounding statement. It is a searching statement because not, not just anyone can make it and it be true. He is David's shepherd. He is the shepherd of everyone who truly belongs to God through faith in Christ. But the question is, is he really your shepherd? Do you know Christ? Have you been saved from your sins? Have you been brought into fellowship with God? Is he really, is God really your shepherd? It's a searching statement. It is a comforting statement because to say that the Lord is your shepherd is to acknowledge 
that everything that is true of God has now been committed to you, his child, in terms of his, what is available to God to care for you and lead you and guide you and do all the things that he does in our lives. It is, it is almighty God who is our shepherd that should comfort us. It is a submissive statement because to make this statement is to acknowledge that you need a shepherd. And only a submissive heart will rejoice in the idea that the Lord is that shepherd. So it's a statement of relationship. And then following that statement of relationship, we walked with David through a survey of riches, the riches that belong to this relationship. If the Lord is your shepherd, then what is true? What is true in your life? What is true of this relationship? Well, the very first statement is, when the Lord is your shepherd, you lack nothing. I shall not want. And we saw that that word want means to, to lack, to be without. I shall not lack. When the Lord is your shepherd, you are cared for. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside literally waters of rest. And so the Lord feeds his sheep with tender green grass, and he waters and refreshes his people. You are well fed. You are refreshed when the Lord is your shepherd. You are provided for. Your needs are met. And then we saw that when the Lord is your shepherd, you are, you are truly preserved. Verse 3 says, he restores my soul. And the word means to turn back. He, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. And so the Lord doesn't just leave us to go our own way, but he sets our feet on paths of righteousness. And he does this for the sake of his name. He preserves us in the way in which we should walk. He leads us on straight, right paths. Such is the richness of this relationship with God. But now when you come to verse 4, you'll notice the language changes. Up to this point, David has spoken of God in the third person, hasn't he? David has written, he, he does these things, you see. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. When you come to verse 4, now it is the language of personal address. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Not he is with me, but you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. This is not theoretical. This is personal. This is not, here is what I know is true of God, and therefore I can draw the conclusion it is true of me. There's nothing wrong with that or invalid about that, but he's doing something more. Now David is speaking directly to God. This is the language of personal relationship. Lord, this is how you have dealt with me personally and experientially. So that as we move into the next section of this psalm, this is how our own life is tested. Can we utter these personal affirmations? Are these things really in our hearts? Can we say, Lord, you have done this for me? I will fear no evil for you are with me. Can you say that? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Are these statements that you can make about your own relationship with God? So we move from a statement about personal relationship and a survey of riches to supernatural assurance. That's what these verses are about, supernatural assurance. This is about a gift that God gives to his people. Assurance is a gift. Everything we've seen to this point warrants assurance. If verses 1 through 3 are true, and they are, then you ought to feel the way that David expresses himself in verses 4 through 6. Verses 1 through 3 warrant this. In fact, not only do they warrant it, they require it. 
If verses 1 through 3 are true, then verses 4 through 6 are true. But though it is warranted and though it is, speaks of something that is now required, it doesn't make it automatic. There are many people who truly could say that the Lord is their shepherd who lack the kind of assurance that is expressed in verses 4 through 6. And assurance has more than one aspect to it. There is the kind of assurance that says, I know that I'm really one of his sheep. I know that I'm a child of God. That's one kind of assurance. There is the assurance that has to do with the end of the road. I know that I'm on my way to heaven. I know that if I, if I die, I will be in the presence of God. That's another aspect of assurance. But then there is the assurance that we should experience in between those two realities. That in fact, we will never experience until we bring logically and truly into our everyday experience the knowledge of those two realities. If the Lord has saved you and if he holds on to you and you're secure until the end, then what is his relationship to you in the present? Isn't it amazing that someone could say, I know that I'm saved, I know that I'm going, going to heaven one day, but now I have to battle this constant sense of, of anxiety in my life every day. I lack peace on a daily basis. How could that be true? Well, the way you're going to experience this assurance from the Holy Spirit is knowledge. You're going to have to take the knowledge of these things and really really look at these things and believe these things, but it's more, it's more than knowledge. You have to choose to live your life in light of that knowledge. You have to, in your own mind and heart, relate yourself to God based on that knowledge. And so tonight we have the opportunity to have the Holy Spirit impart to our hearts a sense of assurance based upon the truth of our relationship to God. Look at verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What kind of assurance do we have? What, what is this life of assurance? First of all, it's a life of trust. The life of assurance, the kind of assurance we should have in the present, is that we really trust the Lord. We trust God. You will not know assurance until you know that your life is in God's hand and there your life is safe. so that even if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there is no reason to be afraid. Do you know that? Do you believe that? Now, how do we understand these, these words, the shadow of death? Shadow of death translates a single Hebrew word. It's a word that's really made up of two words, one meaning death, the other shadow or darkness. And sometimes when you have these, these words made up of more than, than one, the word that is, is made is, is used of the superlative. And so some have taken this to mean the deepest darkness. Though I walk through the valley of the deepest darkness. And when you see how this particular word is used in the book of Job, especially, Oftentimes it's used to speak of just darkness, a place of darkness. But also in the book of Job, it is used to speak clearly in one particular place of, of the darkness of death. And so if we ask how, how should we apply this verse, one way that it's been applied by the Holy Spirit in the lives of God's people throughout the ages is when they are literally walking through the valley of death. When they are on death's doorstep, when they are coming to the end of their lives. It is no accident that the Spirit of God has comforted many believing hearts with that statement found in verse 4 when they were dying. And when this passage is applied to the death of the saints, it's completely accurate because our Lord and Savior walked a dark pathway before us in our place because he was forsaken because he bore the wrath of God upon himself 
because he conquered the grave and the serpent, death no longer holds the believer in bondage. It has no grip on us. When it's all said and done, there will be no sting in it for us. So that for a believer, when we, when we make our way from this life into the presence of our God, it is a walk. It's not a station. We're not stationed in a place of darkness and death. It's a walk and it's a valley. It's not a prison. It is a shadow because Christ endured the substance. It is darkness. It is sobering. It is real. But on the other side is light. As the believer passes into the presence of God. And even where there is darkness, there is no reason for us to fear because for God, the darkness is as light. There's no difference. Psalm 139 verse 8 says, If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. We as fellow believers, we can walk through a great many things together. When it comes to the day of our death, if the Lord should tarry and if we should live our lives to, to the end of those lives, we can't walk through that together. But we don't walk that pathway alone, do we? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So one way it can be applied is to the, to the death of the saints, but also it can be applied to the way that we live our lives. It can be applied to every dark moment, even the, the deepest, darkest times in your life. The darkest times that you walk through from the standpoint of relationships, there are believers who gather with us every service who are hurting in some, some area of relationship in their lives. Maybe it's with their children. Maybe it's with the person they're married to. Maybe it's with someone who is persecuting them. Dark times relationally. Sometimes we walk through valleys emotionally. Discouragement, depression is not a stranger to the saints of God. The idea that you're a Christian, therefore, you will never know depression is just a false idea. It's false from the standpoint of what is revealed in Scripture, and it's false from the standpoint of what we see in church history. Believers can struggle greatly in the realm of their emotions, and there are going to be days when we walk through dark times. And we can know dark times circumstantially, where it seems like there's no way out, and we don't know what the solutions are. I thought Derek Kidner made a great point when he said that we should remember that this valley is as surely the pathway of righteousness as the green pasture is. We forget that sometimes. We, we have no problem seeing the green pastures as the pathway that God has destined for us to walk in, but somehow when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, now we wonder if we're in the right place. Now the Lord's hand leads us into these places also. F.B. Meyer wrote a great classic devotional commentary on this psalm. He had this to say. He said, quote, There is a good purpose in all these shadowed valleys. They test the quality of the soul. They reveal our weak places. They unveil the stars that peer down through the interspaces of rock and tree. They make us follow the shepherd closely lest we lose him. They teach us to value as never before the rod and staff. Blessed are those who do not see, but who yet believe, and who are content 
to be stripped of all joy and comfort and ecstasy, if it be the shepherd's will, so long as there is left to them the sound of his voice and the knowledge that he is near. Close quote. We all know it. Every believer could stand and testify that some of the closest times of fellowship that you've ever known with our God have been times that were dark times for you. But the Lord does things in these dark valleys in our lives that don't get accomplished any other way or in any, any other place. So what is David's affirmation concerning these valleys? Verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he says, I will fear no evil. Here's his affirmation. I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid of harm. I will not be afraid of that which would threaten to destroy me. Be it in the re relational realm or be it in the emotional realm or in the realm of my circumstances, I will not be afraid. He is saying that in the, in the darkest of ravines, he trusts that the shepherd will lead him safely. He trusts that the shepherd is his security. In fact, he gives us the anchor for his affirmation in the next statement. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why not, David? For you are with me. It is God's presence that is his confidence. And the greatest example of this that we have, the greatest example of what it means to trust God as you walk through a dark valley to know that his presence is enough, the greatest example we have is our shepherd Savior, the Lord Jesus, who faced such a valley of the shadow of death that he could even say, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will be done, but yours. He trusted the Father every step of the way, all the way to the cross. John 16, 32, Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. Indeed, they scattered. Indeed, the Lord Jesus was all alone, but he wasn't alone. And he knew he wasn't alone because he rested in the Father's presence. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Why don't you look at Psalm 91, please? It is no uh, coincidence that we have a verse that refers to the Messiah in the midst of this psalm. Look at Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow, arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, 
lest you strike your foot against a stone. You recognize that, don't you? You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot because he holds fast to me in love. I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. Folks, the scripture says that everyone who knows the name of God puts their trust in him. To know his name is to know that he's trustworthy. Verse 15, when he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Look back at Psalm 23. So David expresses his confidence in the Lord. This is the life of assurance. This is the assurance that you have when the Lord is your shepherd. You can trust him even in the darkest place, even in the deepest valley. But now there's a, a second expression of assurance. The life of assurance is not only a life of trust, it is a life of security. Into verse 4, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff. The rod used for protection, short handle larger at the top, used for fighting off predators, used for defending against robbers. The rod, the staff, more like a walking stick. You've seen pictures of these with a crook, the shepherd's crook, used to guide the sheep, to keep them in order, to rescue them when they're in hard-to-get-to places. The rod and the staff... Both can be symbols of discipline. In fact, whenever the, the word translated rod is not translated scepter, when it's not in a context where it refers to a king's scepter, I looked up all of these references to rod, and in almost every case, when it wasn't a scepter, it was in a context of discipline. So David, thinking about God as his shepherd, takes comfort in the knowledge of his rod and his staff. In other words, the psalmist has a shepherd who is not inattentive to him. He will guide his sheep and he will discipline his sheep. He will rescue his sheep. The sheep are not left to their own desires. Their fate is not determined by their own choices. The shepherd watches over the sheep, redirecting them, guiding them, rescuing them. He knows his sheep. His sheep know him. He will not lose any of his sheep. His sheep are safe in his hand. No one will snatch them away. This is what Jesus said, John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. What is this? This is security. You can trust Him. Even in the darkest valley, you can trust him. His rod and his staff should comfort you. His eye is upon you. You're not lost to him. You are safe in his hand and he will not let you go and no one will ever snatch you away. Now we would love tonight to be able to say, that most of the time when the shepherd is rescuing us and redirecting us, it is because of something done to us by an enemy, right? You'd love to be able to say, I'm in that ditch because of my enemies, and the Lord is constantly rescuing me from my enemies. Unfortunately, I think every true child of God knows better than that. Most of the rescuing work that God has done in our lives, most of the redirecting work that God has done in our lives, it has not been because of an enemy. It's been because of our own foolishness. It's been because of our own disobedience. It's been because of our own waywardness. 
Most of the time when the shepherd is rescuing, it is because his sheep have gotten themselves into trouble. Is that not right? Again, Meyer captured this very well when he said this, very often, sin not only grieves him, but it plunges us into circumstances of misery and trouble which threaten to overwhelm us. At such times he is not unmindful of his own. And though we may seem to have forfeited all claim to his care, yet he is a very present help in time of trouble. He does not permit us to reap what we have sown. Can it, but let me just stop there for a moment and ask you, can anyone say here that you have reaped everything you have sown? I read on, he says this, he averts the full penalty of our own mistakes and misdeeds. He comes after us in the wilderness, not staying his foot until he has discovered the pit into which we have fallen, from which he does not fail to drag us forth, placing us on his shoulders if we are too weak to walk, and bringing us back, satisfied with no other recompense than that we are safe. Oh, the long-suffering patience of Christ who will not permit us to be overwhelmed by the sorrows and penalties which we have incurred, but will reach out his crook to drag us back from the death that we had courted. Close quote. What a fabulous description that is. And what an accurate one. If the Lord had allowed us to go our own way, where would we be? How often have we courted death in terms of our own choices? For God to extend his staff and with that crook pull us out of the, the ditch that we're in and set our feet on straight paths to the glory of his name. When you realize that, you begin to see what really makes sin sinful. I pray that the Lord would teach us that the greatest way of seeing the sinfulness of our sin is not by measuring our sins against the law of God, but by measuring our sins against the love of God. The law of God identifies our sins, but the love of God magnifies our sins. Because the Lord has been good to us despite our sinfulness. The Lord has loved us despite our waywardness. When we willfully choose to go against the will of our God, we're not just sinning against His law, we're sinning against all of the overwhelming expressions of His love toward us, which is constant and faithful and trustworthy and true. Do you see that? Is your heart broken over your sinfulness? Is your heart broken over your disobedience? And is what breaks your heart not just the knowledge that it is against the law of God, but that it is in the face of the love of God? And yet how faithful our shepherd is to not deal with us according to our sins, but according to his mercy. O oh Lord, if you should mark iniquities, what? Who could stand? So, the Lord is our shepherd. If we're his people, what does that mean? It means that he is worthy of your trust. It means that even when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, there's no reason to fear because he's with you. So listen, if he's worthy of your trust, if you really are safe, then trust him. Is there anybody here tonight you need to trust him? You feel like you're in a dark, dark place? And you're afraid? 
If the Lord is your shepherd, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, do not fear. He is there. When the Lord is your shepherd, it means that he is in charge of your safety. You are secure. There is a rod that will fight off the predators, and there's a staff that will keep you in line and even pull you out of the mud. The Lord is your shepherd. Now, will you rest in that knowledge? Will you recognize that your whole life is really in his charge? It really is in his charge. He really is in control. He really is in control. Everything you think you control, it's just a mirage, folks. It's just an imagination. Your life is in his hand. Will you rest there? And then when you recognize this, will you love him for it? Will you tonight discover that the greatest motivation you have to live a life that honors his name is that you are loved by him. And you, therefore, love him back. Let's bow together for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we do celebrate your goodness and your faithfulness, your wisdom, your power that is on display when we consider our lives and all that has made up our life and all that goes into our life story. Lord, when we see how you have guided our steps, rescued us from death, given to us good things. It calls our hearts out to you and it makes us desire to live for you. Lord, I pray that we would not just see this tonight, but that this would be the theme of our lives. That, that we would we recognize ourselves to be a, a people loved by God and shepherded by God. And therefore, we would honor you with our trust and with our rest, but also, Lord, with our, our diligent service. I ask you for this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.